we bought this lie that we are a victim to our thoughts. We are at war. Tell me if this sounds familiar. I wake up in the morning and I'm thinking to myself, I really need to get a lot of work done today. And then I think, first I'm gonna spend some time with Jesus. So what do I do? I pick up my phone and then I notice this email about something I'm working on and it's got some feedback in it for me and all of a sudden, I'm completely discouraged. And the next thing I know, I start distracting myself with Instagram, looking at all the gorgeous pictures of awesome people doing awesome things and then in a few minutes, I notice myself thinking I don't measure up. I'm in the worst mood all of a sudden. I've decided that I'm a bad writer, that I'm spending my life on meaningless things, that I, I don't matter, that I have nothing to say, and I start spiraling. And then my husband, Zach, he'll walk in, and he's all happy. He just met with Jesus. He says, good morning. And all of a sudden, I snap at him for no reason. My mind is just spinning out. It's in chaos. And in less than an hour, I have completely diminished myself, criticized all my work, decided to quit the ministry. I've ignored God. I've pushed away my best friend. And I know I sound crazy. And I bet this is not inspiring a whole lot of confidence in you right now as we start this journey together. But, but I wanna be honest that this is a struggle, that every one of us finds ourselves at war in our brains every single day. We bought this lie that we are a victim to our thoughts. I have bought this lie. But in the next six weeks, we're gonna look at the scriptures. We're gonna look at what he tells us and you're gonna see again and again this truth that we are not victims to our thoughts, that we have authority over our thoughts. But what's interesting is the Bible doesn't call us victims. It calls us warriors. And, and we were built to fight the greatest battle in our generation, this battle of our minds. So I wanna take just a minute before we get started here and I wanna to speak to those of you that struggle with mental illness and say, first of all, that I am so sorry and that this is familiar to me. I have walked through different seasons with anxiety and depression and my, those close to me have done the same thing. So I'm sorry. And I also wanna say that I'm gonna say some things that are very authoritative, that we have power over our thoughts, but, but I don't wanna mislead you. There are certain things we don't have power over, chemical imbalances, are like cancer, you cannot just will yourself to not have cancer. This is a war, I know it, but counseling and medicine can be a part of that road to healing. And, and I think oftentimes we have not, um, the church has said, yeah, believe more in Jesus and all that, and I don't wanna be that person. I want you to know that there is a place for medicine and a place for counseling, and I don't want you to feel shame. However, I believe that the study, I want you to stay because I believe it can help. I believe that some of you are past the point of medicine and counseling. You don't need that anymore. You just have these spirals that you don't believe or know that you can interrupt. I believe that there is hope if you stay. And God can use this to shift things in your mind. You might be thinking that I don't have energy for this or this isn't that urgent for me or my mind's a mess, but nothing I've tried before has worked and what's gonna be different this time? And maybe you've meditated, you've tried to be mindful, you've tried journaling, but nothing seems to stick. This is a battle of light and darkness. The enemy is coming for us. This is not as simple as, let me train my mind. Guys, we are at war with the enemy. This is how he comes for us. This is how he came for me that morning. He comes for us through our phones. He comes for us through our discouragement. He comes for us with lies that we have believed for way too long. And what we're gonna talk about here, it's more than some brain hack or a trick that you can play on yourself or, or practices or principles. It's a deep rewiring and renewing of our mind. It's a centering on the person of Jesus Christ. If, if we're gonna do anything that's worthwhile in this life, then we're gonna have to walk in a power that is not of our own. A power that we've been given because of Jesus Christ. And we have to get a hold of this thing between our ears. Now, it's exciting because in the last 20 years, more about the brain has been discovered than in the last 2000. There are researchers that can 
tell you how your brain works. We understand things about the brain that, that no other generation has ever understood about the brain. And what's cool is God built our brains. Although we still have a long way to go with that research, science keeps confirming that, that the truths in this book are true. And what the Bible said thousands of years ago, what God said thousands of years ago, it perfectly describes what we know now from science. And, and the truth is that we can interrupt spirals that we have a choice, that our emotions are a byproduct of the way we think. And we can actually start to change our thinking. And that's what Paul said. The Apostle Paul calls it having the mind of Christ. In these weeks we have together, we're gonna stick with what Paul says. We're gonna look at the letters of Paul, specifically in the book of Philippians. And we're gonna see how Paul sets his mind on hope. He sets his mind on Jesus. And Paul writes more about the mind than anyone else in the Bible. And I, I believe it's because he knew that how we think will turn into how we live. I wanna read to you a couple of these passages that are gonna lay the groundwork for what we're gonna talk about here. The first one is in Romans, Paul wrote this, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind so that we may know what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Guys, he's saying it's possible. He's saying it's possible to renew our minds and that that one step can transform everything else. And then he's gonna say in 2 Corinthians, he's gonna say, we destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God. And we take every thought captive to obey Christ. He says, we have the power to destroy. We have the authority to control our minds to not be subject to whatever whim or mood or thought plagues us. We have authority over it. Guys, this may be news to you. No one may have ever told you that you are not a victim to your thoughts, that you have authority and power, God-given power over your thoughts. And that shift could change everything. So we don't wanna just notice and capture thoughts, but we want to set them and fix them on something. This is our only hope. You can't just empty out all the negative thoughts. You have to set them on something. And I believe as you set them on this thing, everything shifts. I don't think you can wrestle down every fear, but I believe that God could become so big that things fall away. I love this quote from A.W. Tozer. In fact, I think I've probably quoted it in every Bible study I've ever taught. Put God in his rightful place and 1,000 problems are solved all at once. And I teach it in every Bible study because it's my only hope to give you. I want that. I want 1,000 problems solved all at once and we can have that. And Paul lived that way. In fact, he lived with this radical shift in his perspective. If you know anything about Paul, you know that he really started out as a bad guy, an actual killer, murderer of Christians. But then he had this encounter with the risen Jesus and everything shifted. He was rapidly and completely rewired. Paul knew that how he thought would equal how he lived. So in this study, we're gonna drill down into this letter in the Philippian church. We're gonna see how he thought. But first, we're gonna go back to the, in the Bible a little bit, and we're gonna look at Acts 16. This is the story of how that Philippian church that he was writing a letter to, this is how that church actually began. And these people that he's writing to, they have names. And Paul and his friends went through the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. And when they had come up to Mashiach, they attempted to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus didn't allow them. Now, I don't want you to miss these little statements here. The Holy Spirit was clearly forbidding them to go to Asia, which is desperately where Paul wanted to go. And a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia was standing there urging him and saying, come over to Macedonia and help us. And when Paul had seen the vision, immediately he sought to go to Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. Now the writer of Acts wants to be super clear about two things. He wants every one of us to know that God did not want him to go to Asia and that God did want Paul to go to Macedonia. Now let me tell you what happens when he gets to Macedonia. He gets put in prison. So God says, my big awesome plan is I'm going to put you in a prison cell. 
I'm going to stop you from evangelizing an entirely new part of the world, a whole continent. And instead, I'm going to plop you down for a lot of the rest of your life in and out of prison. Now, if I'm Paul, honestly, I'm very cranky. I'm spinning out. But guess what? In those prison cells, Paul would go on to write almost every letter that he wrote in the New Testament in prison. And it turns out Philippi is actually the leading city in the district of Macedonia, a Roman colony, one of the only Roman colonies in that space. This was a power center. It's strategically a great place to go, but within days, hours, weeks, Paul's in prison. And in that time, Paul is in Philippi. He helps three people become Christians, three people, three, (laughs) not 3,000, three. A woman that was a slave that was possessed by a demon, a woman that was wealthy named Lydia, who was actually having a prayer gathering that was religious outside of her house, and then a jailer, one jailer. So these three people are how the Philippian church begins. And years later, Paul will be in prison again in Rome now, and he's writing this letter to the Philippians, back to that church. He should have been wrestling a little bit more than he was. In fact, how is he not furious? There's something about the way that Paul thinks about his life, the way that Paul thinks about God and his plans for him, that all he wants is to obey. All Paul wants is to be exactly where God wants him. And we're gonna hear him praise God for his prison cell. I am not naturally like this. I think I have great ideas of what God should do with me, with my kids, with our lives, and very few of those great ideas include things like prison, cancer, suffering. Because who wants plans like that? I get that this is hard to share. And the reason I actually wrote this study is because for a year and a half of my life, I was spinning out and wrestling with something pretty big and I didn't share it with anybody. Every night at 3 a.m. I would wake up at the same time and I would spin and spin and spin with this incredibly dark thought, what if God is not real? At night I would think of it, if it just goes to black and heaven isn't true and this is all pretend, then what am I doing wasting my life preaching Jesus? Like what am I doing leaving my kid's soccer game and talking about God? Like what, what is that? Like I'm wasting my life. I wanted to shut down ministry. I wanted to crawl in a hole of comfort. I wanted to binge watch Netflix. I, I did not want to risk anything for God that might be pretend. And I'll tell you exactly when it started to shift for me. I was walking around um, a track with my friends, my small group, and they had no idea about any of this. I just hadn't mentioned it. And I, I did that day. I said it out loud. And as soon as I said it out loud, I had this thought. I thought, what did I just say? It's my first time to say it out loud. I, I will never forget it. And immediately the next thought in my head was, this is ludicrous. I believe God. This is the enemy. This is coming for me. In the night, in the dark, when nobody's there to defend me, this is the enemy. In the dark, I was giving the enemy time for conversation. Anything he wanted to say to me, I gave it to him. And for a year and a half, he had me. When I brought it into the light, my people started praying for me. They started fighting for me. They fasted, they prayed. They saw it immediately. This is attack. We've got we've to fight this. And so we did together and, and it shifted. In the middle of the night, I would wake up and instead I would read in Psalms where it says, if I go down to Sheol, if I go down to the dark grave, you are there. And I would repeat those passages over and over again. And I'm telling you, it wasn't immediate, but guys, I got free. That spiral shifted. And now I don't wake up very often at night, but when I do, it actually is some of the sweetest time with Jesus. This can shift. You do not have to live stuck and spiraling for the rest of your life, but you might if you don't go to war with this. You need somebody to go to war with. You need somebody that's gonna fight for you. Somebody that you can say out loud the words, I am wrestling with blank, no matter what that blank is. Those things that you can't control, the part of the plan that isn't going right, that's sending you spinning, the the diagnosis or the addiction. We carry those things, but we carry them together and we take them to God. And and that renewal of our mind, it happens as we pray. It happens as we conform our minds to this book. 
It happens as we close our eyes, we talk to God because he is real and he is fighting for you. And what we believe about God and what we think about God, it matters. And the enemy knows it. And if he isn't going to take you down in some big dramatic way, he's going to get in your head and he's going to distract you. He's going to make you doubt. He's going to make you afraid. It's not that all these problems are going to go away. It's that all of these problems are going to be held together in and through knowing and loving a powerful God. Our perspective shifts and our lives and our minds and our relationship shifts. Now, the interesting thing about Paul is you're sitting here today because Paul was locked up for most of his ministry in a prison. The gospel went for generations because God knew if I put that man in a prison cell, he will write letters. He will write letters, no big deal. He doesn't know that those letters will bring a church together for thousands and thousands of years and instruct them and teach them how to know and love Jesus more. As we stand, as we fight, as we take hold of the mind of Christ, He frees us, He gives us peace, no matter what our prison cell is. So in these weeks, we're gonna bring a lot to the light. We're gonna say things out loud. We're gonna fight for each other We're gonna get encouragement from Paul from his prison cell, showing us how to be strong in our mind and our heart when we're in ours. You are not helpless against your thoughts. God gives us tools and together we're gonna go learn how to break spirals and just see what God can do with a mind that is completely and wholly focused on Him.